Hi guys, this is Studio Slave, and in this video I'm going to go through some quick fire tips or things you don't know in Ableton Live. If you want to know more about the tips covered, then check out the description links and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. In this quick tip, we're going to get a drum rack to audition our favourite samples. So I'm just going to drag these samples into the zone section of Sampler, and then we go to the selection area. We can see we've got 11 samples here, so we just drag the selection bars down to 10, plus the 0 is 11 and then we right click and we distribute the ranges equally. We can then map our chain selector or sample selector to a macro control and then we set this to the maximum number of samples which is 10. So now our macro control can't go past 10. And this allows us to hot swap between our different samples as well. For this tip, I've created a simple little pattern and at the moment this is all housed within the drum rack. So we have the chains on this drop down arrow. So what we can do is we can extract the chains by right clicking and clicking extract chains and it is now a track outside of this drum rack. What we can also do is we can have reverb sends within the drum rack. So if we go to our browser we can just drop in a reverb device and when we do this we start to get our sends here in the chains. If however we don't want to have it within the drum rack then what we can do is we can create a new chain and if we open the input output or IO of the drum rack we can send this straight to our return track so it's now being used as a through track which means that we don't have to mess around going into the drum rack to use the sends and returns. In the next tip I'm going to show you choke groups which are used to emulate a real drummer so they can't hit two certain drums at the same time such as hi-hats so in this case this is how it sounds without choke groups and if we put these both into the same group, you can hear how one symbol chokes the other. And this is going to give us a more realistic sound. The easiest way of staying in key is to use the scale device, but this isn't going to help you when you want to actually compose in clip view. So if we go into clip view, what you can actually do is you can create some notes and you can drag these behind the loop brace and then mute them. So in this case, I'm going to go for the key of C minor. So I'm just going to create the notes. And once I've got all of these, as you can see, they're muted. And then we can copy these notes up and down an octave. And then we press the fold button. We can now see only the notes in the scale. So if for some reason we're out of the scale, then we're going to see this because we're going to have a gap in our notes on the left hand side. So I'll just push one of these notes out of the scale, fold it again. And you can now see that we have a note that's not in scale. So all we have to do is unfold and push this up or down to stay within the scale. So this is a really good method for when you're trying to compose your own little melodies or chord progressions. Going on from what we just covered, we can also use this technique to write ourselves some very simple diatonic chord patterns and progressions. So we know here that we have our, our root note, which is C minor. So we have our C, we have our second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh notes. So if we go for choose a note, skip a note, choose a note, skip a note, we're going to have our chord progressions here. So this is going to be our one chord, and then we can push this up to our five chord. We can then go to our three chord, and then we could even go to our seven chord below. This is nice and easy to do with clip view when it's folded, but if we unfold, we can now see that even though we've just drawn these in nice and simply, we're still keeping the minor major relationship for each of our chord progressions. Lots of music producers that aren't classically trained like to use chord codes to write their chords. So to do this, you just choose a root note. So we'll go for A. So all we're going to do, starting on A as zero, we're going to count up zero, one, two, three, four. And then we'll go up five, six, and seven. So that's zero, four, and seven, which is our major chord. And if we wanted to change that to a minor, it would be zero, three, and seven. So we'll go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there we have our minor chord. So there's loads of different chord codes. And if you want to know more, check the link in the description. In this tip, we're going to use follow actions to get Ableton to write us a simple chord progression. So here I've just got all of the different chords or the simple chords that we have for A minor. And if we go to the launch panel, we've got the follow action set to one bar. So we're going to choose it to select any clip after one bar. So as you can see here, it's just jumping between these clips now. And what we can do is create a new MIDI channel and we're going to route this output into this new MIDI channel. So we can see in real time 
our new chords that are being created and we can record them. So now we have Ableton randomly giving us a chord progression and of course you could add your own chords in as well if you wanted to use other chords such as sus chords. And what we can now do is we can jump in and we can invert some of these chords using the shift up and down arrow keys just to make our chords flow a little bit better or we'll make any edits that we might find appropriate. And then what we can do is we can drag this back in and see how it sounds using the operator track that we have already created. In this next tip, we're going to go one further from our last one. And what we're going to do is we're going to essentially resample some MIDI. So at the moment, we're just resampling our standard operator chords. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add a few effects such as the arpeggiator, note length and velocity. And whilst this is recording in real time, as we play with these effects, we're going to be recording the output onto this new MIDI channel. And then once we have this recorded output, what we can then do is edit or copy it and then use it elsewhere within our project. So we'll just select this area here, copy this, and then we can paste this into a new MIDI clip. In this next tip, we're going to create a new track and we're going to create dummy tracks so we can fire off clips and have different effects clips going off at the same time on a completely independent track. So we'll just name a track dummy. We then set the routing of our drum rack so it's then going into our dummy track and we set the monitor to in so it's now acting as an auxiliary channel. Next we can just add some simple effects to our dummy track or whichever effects we want to use and then what we have to do is we have to add some clips to our dummy track and just turn the gain all the way down so it's just being used as an empty vessel. We can then go to our envelopes and we can start to use the clip automation as we want to for our dummy clips. So in this case we're just going to trigger a nice slow reverb send. And we can hear this dummy clip is now affecting our drum rack audio. So we can go one further with this and we can change this to something like reverb splashes. So I'll just pull this all the way down and we're going to use the pencil tool just to add in some reverb splashes. At the moment this envelope is linked but what we can do is we can unlink this envelope which allows us to draw in the automation along a much longer time period. So we can just duplicate this loop and we can still have our drum rack operating over one, two, three or four bars whilst our effects automation can be looping over a much longer time period. In this case 16 bars. So this is a really useful and powerful tool to use in a live environment when you want to be using effects and builds and you can just fire off clips at random. In this tip we're going to create some swirling atmospheric effects using the reverb freeze. So in this case I'm just going to press play as normal and then when we get to around 50% I'll hit the freeze button and what we can now do is we can turn off the input audio but because we've frozen our reverb it's going to carry on cycling through and that's going to carry on forever. So what we can then do is place a compressor onto our reverb track and we can sidechain this to our sidechain trigger for a nice pumping atmospheric sound. This next tip allows us to reference quickly between our master and our reference track. So to do this, I've just got a standard audio track here named reference and we just change the input output to external out. So it's bypassing the master. And then what we're also going to do is we're going to replace a utility device on the master and also on the reference track. And if we go into the key mapping, what we're going to do is we're going to map the mute switches of both of these devices to a bracket or a key of your choice. And then once we've mapped these, we're just going to set one so it's off and the other one so it's on. So now what we can do is we can play some audio that we're going to reference. And now what this allows us to do is with the touch of one button, we can reference our track and our master. And we can also make sure it's game matched and in time as well. In this next tip, I'm going to show you how you can view, edit and create different grooves for the groove pool. So what we can do if we like this groove of this audio track is we can extract the groove from this right drop down menu. And this is going to make this new groove appear in the groove pool. If we want to see what this groove looks like, then we can just go into the groove pool and we can drag this onto an empty MIDI track and it's going to show as MIDI notes with MIDI velocities which we can edit. Once we've done the editing, what we can then do is drop it back into the groove pool and then if we want, we can bring in another clip and we can drop this new groove onto that clip and press the commit button and it's now going to commit this new groove to our audio. So this way we can make sure all of our different audio is working off the same groove. If you're using a lot of plugins and you've got quite a CPU intensive project, what you can do is you can freeze your tracks by right clicking and selecting freeze track. 
and then once you've done this you can then either flatten the track or you can drag it onto a new audio track so if we create an audio track we'll just drag this across and you'll see this will flatten this down and remove any of the plugins so it's just audio or failing that we can just right click and select flatten track it's a good idea at the start of your Ableton projects when you're in the recording phase to use a small buffer size as this is going to give you a smaller latency or delay which means that your keyboard or your MIDI controller is going to be nice and responsive when you're playing things in and it's not going to put you off. Then as you start to use more CPU intensive plugins and you start getting into the mix phase you push the buffer size up and that way you've got a lot more CPU free for dealing with your CPU intensive plugins and because you've finished recording it doesn't matter that you now have a bit of a higher latency. When you do move into the mixing phase, make sure you pull up your faders so you get in as much resolution as you possibly can, so you can be nice and accurate. And you can also use the numerical value box to type in exact values, so you can be super accurate. Within Ableton, you can set your own default presets for the project, tracks, and audio effects. So if we create a new audio track, you'll see it's set to zero. Some people like to have this set at minus six, so what we can now do is right click, Save this as the default audio track and now when we make a new audio track it should already be set to minus 6 as you can see here. We can also do this for things such as the audio devices just by right clicking on the device title bar and selecting save as default preset once we've set the settings that we want to keep. For a free default project template check out the link in the description. When using limiters it can be very easy to get carried away with the loudness bias and pushing well too much gain into a limiter and it's going to sound really squashed. So to prevent this, map the ceiling and the gain to the same macro control. Go into the map macro settings and all we're going to do is change a few of these settings. So essentially as we push the gain up, we're also going to be pulling the ceiling down. So what this does is it counteracts the loudness bias and helps us to find a position where we're getting the most amount of gain with the least amount of side effects because we're taking out that bias by pushing the loudness up as well. Once you've found the optimal position for your limiter, don't forget to unmap the ceiling and set it back to zero so you're actually still going to get the right amount of loudness. If you're having problems with your Ableton file sizes, what you can do is you can reduce the file size by reducing the amount of files that you're referencing and the size of these files. So because this loop is the same all the way through, all I'm going to do is I'm going to slice it and I'm going to turn loop on and then I'm just going to loop this. So instead of referencing a file which is a few bars long, we're just referencing a file which is one bar long and we've just duplicated it out. What we can also do if we need to control the size of our project is we can go to manage, go to project and then we can delete any of the unused files just by clicking show and then deleting them out of the browser. If we find we still have quite a large project, then what we can also do is go into the project contents and look at the media files and see if there's any parts that we don't need. And then we can pack our project down, which uses really good compression to get our project as small as possible, which will turn it into a .alp file. For this next tip, we're going to go through a whole host of shortcuts that we can use to speed up our workflow in Ableton Live. So the first one is the tab function and what that does is it allows us to move between session view and arrangement view and we can also use the shift tab and this is going to take us between device and clip view. The next set of shortcuts are used to change the layout of Ableton Live so we can do this by holding command and alt or option and then we can press B for browser, O for overview, I for inputs and outputs S for sends, R for returns, and M for mixer. And with those layout shortcuts, they're different for session view and arrangement view. So we can have all of them showing in the arrangement view or in session view, and then we can go across to our arrangement view and we can have it set differently. So we're maximizing the amount of space in each of our different views. Next shortcut is if we want to find something in the browser, we can use the command and F or command and find and then we can just type in what we need to find in the search bar and it will search the whole of the browser. So in this case we'll go for a MIDI device and another shortcut is we can obviously drag this into a track but if we don't want to do this we can double click the instrument and it will also auto populate that instrument into the track as well. The next shortcut is to simply use the command shortcut when we're changing any parameters and what this does is this gives us finer control which is especially useful on things like the channel faders and any pan pots or macro controls. The next shortcut is to use the space bar to stop or start the playback and if we use the shift and space then what this will do is this will carry on the playback from the last place we stopped instead of going back to the playhead marker or the start of the track. The next set of shortcuts we can use for editing using the command function. 
So we can use Command and X to cut, we can use Command and V to paste, or we can copy with Command and C, and likewise we can paste with Command and V. We can also use Command and D to duplicate, Command and E to slice, and Command and J to consolidate clips together. Command and R can be used to rename clips, and finally if we're renaming tracks, we can press the Command and R function, and then once we've named the track, we can simply press Tab to rename the next track without having to use the Command R function again. As well as these editing shortcuts, we've also got the Command A shortcut, which will select all. And then if we make a slice here using Command and E, we can undo this using Command and Z, and we can redo this using Command and X. If we've got a highlighted area and we want to loop it, we can use Command and L, and also if we have a loop selection and we need to select that area then we can use command and shift L. We can also easily copy clips around the arrangement just by holding down alt when we click and drag the clips around. Command shift and M will insert a MIDI clip, all we have to do is select the area where we want the clip to populate. To create tracks we can use command and T for an audio track, command shift and T for a MIDI track and command and alt T for a return track. Just going back to the browser again quickly, as you can see we've got quite a lot of subfolders within our different folders and devices. If we want to go back to our main folder again, all we have to do is double click the folder and what this will do is it will fold all of the subfolders within it. If we select a device's title bar, we can use the shift command to select multiple devices and then we can use command and G to group these together. We can also access our different map modes by using command and K for key mapping or command and M for MIDI mapping. If we're working within clip view for either audio clips or MIDI clips, we can use Command and U to quantize our audio or our MIDI, or we can use Command Shift and U, and what this will do is it will open our quantize settings and allow us to set them appropriately. So those are the majority of the shortcuts that are worth using on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you take the time just to learn half of those, then you're going to dramatically speed up your workflow and get a lot more tracks finished. I hope you found this video useful. Please don't forget to subscribe and check out our website, studioslave.com. There's plenty more information on the quick tips that we've covered in the links in the description.